Greetings Stargazers and welcome to section 20. Today we'll be talking about the Milky Way and the galaxies that we've discovered by trying to study it. So we're, we're going to break this down into three parts. We'll start off with talking about how we figured out what the Milky Way is. And this is going to be a pseudo history lesson slash scientific investigation. And I think this is an important way to delve into that material because as we were trying to understand this gorgeous view in the sky, we end up learning about the size of the universe. From there, we'll move on to our next section. We'll start breaking down what's the structure of the Milky Way. In this one, we'll figure out how we figure out what the Milky Way is. And then we'll start talking about the specific structures, what we know about its shape and composition. And from there, well, in this section, we're talking about the galaxies that we've discovered. What kind of ways can we classify the galaxies, and what shapes are they going to be in? So, you know the drill by now. Short little reading quiz. Let's ask ourselves, where in the Milky Way is the solar system? We know the Milky Way is this big, gigantic galaxy. Where do we live in that? So, go ahead and pause and come right back. Obviously, some of you might be tempted to think it's this one, that we only have ideas, and I would argue it, we have verifiable evidence. It's not just hypotheses. We are fairly certain of where the solar system is in the Milky Way. And by doing all this composition of different techniques, we've established that we're about here. We're about two-thirds of the radius from the center of the disk. Here is a wonderful picture of the Milky Way over the Himalayas. And now let's start to really ask ourselves, when we look at the night sky, and it's clear enough, you're patient enough for you to actually be able to see the Milky Way, what is it that we're looking at? People may able to see the Milky Way for literally thousands of years. So how do we go from seeing pictures like this, this band across the night sky, how do you go from that image to this big, complex picture of this thing that is literally thousands of light years across? How do you go from just this band of white, almost kind of gassy, dusty stuff to this big, mind-blowingly large galaxy? Well... Let's start some starters. Could we just send objects out there? Could we send a spacecraft or a satellite far enough away to photograph it? Heck no. Right? The Milky Way, just its diameter across, is upwards of 175,000 light years. All right. So we're not going to fly to the edge of the Milky Way anytime soon. Let's about going up. Let's go straight up. Well, we're about in the middle of the Milky Way, in terms of its disk here, we're about in the middle. So we'd only have to go a thousand light years straight up. I'll put some perspective on this. Uh, Voyager 1, this is the furthest man-made object out there. It is currently, after about 50 years of just straight travel in space, it's rounding 150 astronomical units away from the Earth. Which is 0 .002 light years? Which, comparing that to the size of the Milky Way, is 0.0002% the height of the Milky Way. And that's the furthest we've ever launched something to the cosmos. So now we have this problem. How the heck are we supposed to make a map of the Milky Way, get an image of this, when we live in the Milky Way? This is akin to, say, me taking you in a parachute, kick, kicking you out of the airplane, dropping you in the forest, and saying, give me a detailed map of every tree in that forest you're in right now. You're not allowed to move in the forest. All you can see is the different bands of trees where light's coming past the trees. All you can see is the different bands of light coming at you. You're not allowed to move. How are you supposed to map everything there? Well, one thing you're gonna hear me say over and over again is that this is what I call a dusty problem. Turns out there's large, there's a large amount of dust throughout the Milky Way and it makes that difficult to count the total number of stars. Think about it, every time you see a star, 
you can basically roughly estimate how much mass is there and repeat over and over again. Well, the dust obscuring our view, we just don't have a good count of how many stars are here. On top of that, that dust can do all sorts of interactions. Remember how we've discussed how the dust can interact with different wavelengths of light. It can redden something or completely block something from our field of view. So when we're trying to get an understanding of what the Milky Way is, we're going to have this issue of how do you see through the dust and how we eventually get past that problem. So let's come way back to the beginning. Let's go back to the 5th century BCE. And philosophers at that time, yes, there's lots of different interpretations, mythology, building out of what's the Milky Way. But in general, everyone had this idea, that milky substance, that white coloring you see in the Milky Way, that's probably just a lot of stars connected together, nice and compact. And so this was a reigning idea that the Milky Way probably is just a denser region of stars that we're seeing. And it wasn't until the 17th century when Galileo, with his telescopes, were able to finally peer out into the Milky Way and start resolving little points of stars out there. That was the first step, being able to actually say, that's a star, that's a star, that's a star, inside the band of the Milky Way. And that, once again, going back to Galileo's scientific progress, showed that we can build tools and have a better understanding of the universe and conclusively say, yes, this Milky Way, it's not just this big sea of gas, it's a big sea of stars. Now, skip ahead a little further in time. We're past Galileo, and we've gotten to the 18th century, specifically 1755. We have two philosophers to talk about, Thomas Wright and Immanuel Kant, and they're trying to philosophize about what the you know, properties about the Milky Way. And they say, hey, if these are a group of stars, well, shouldn't they be circling around like a solar system? They're trying to take the ideas that we've established. At this point, we've, we're moving into the heliocentric model, and we're seeing stars Milky Way. Why can't the stars be orbiting something? Stars are the planets now on this much bigger scale. Emmanuel Quint went one step further saying that the nebulae that we see in the Milky Way, right? so there's like the Orion Nebula, the Eagle, right? you can see these pockets of denser, brighter regions inside, which people have been calling nebula, the gas clouds. Remember the nebula we discussed before of how solar systems form. Right? Kant said, wait a minute, those are very distinct, and he proposed that they were in fact island universes. That was his term. He had no evidence for this. He was just being a philosopher, speculating, putting ideas out there. But we'll see soon how that name, the island universes, stuck around. Just go only a few decades further ahead, and we'll get to William and Carolyn Herschel, who made the first map of the Milky Way. Now, this map wasn't correct, but it was progress, and it showed how you could take a few underlying assumptions and try and make a model of something. So here's what they did. They had basically one assumption, and it was assume all the stars in the Milky Way are about the same brightness. Just that assumption, assume they're the same brightness. And with that, you can just use the apparent brightness. You look at how bright it is from your view of the night sky, and the dimmer it is, the further away it has to be. The brighter it is, the closer it has to be. So they just one for one basically set out and said, how bright is that? How close is it? And they started getting an estimate of where the stars line up across the Milky Way. And they came up with this map. They got a roughly disk shape and the sun about in the center of this thing. Not quite center, but near enough. Now, we obviously know that this is completely wrong, but once again, credence of being the first ones to map it. And the big issue, they didn't understand how much dust exists in the cosmos and how much that's going to impact their ability to project this. They couldn't be able to account for how many stars there 
not seen behind the dust, and how that dust is diminishing the brightness of those stars. Keep going forward now. We've reached the 19th century, and now we've gotten this huge jump in technology. We've had the Industrial Revolution, and a common thing you're going to notice in science is that as technology improves, our scientific inquiry, our knowledge, gets to improve. And now we want to ask new questions, so build new technology. And with new technology, repeat more knowledge. There's a very cyclical relationship there. Well, the Industrial Revolution meant that we could build better and bigger telescopes. So, a man by the name of Lord Rossi, he had commissioned a telescope. At the time, this was the largest telescope ever invented, and it was a 72-inch aperture, a little bit taller than me. Right? And he said, I'm going to use this telescope to look at these nebula in detail. And by doing that, he was able to see these spiraling patterns in many of these so-called nebulae throughout the cosmos. And on top of that, he went one step further. He was able to resolve individual little pinpoints of light, specific light sources scattered inside those nebulae. He was providing evidence that these nebulae aren't just gas clouds out there. He's starting to provide evidence that they are their own universes, islands far removed from us. There's going to be this constant connection between us trying to study just the Milky Way and the stuff we see in it. And this will come back and forth constantly as we build up our knowledge of the Milky Way. So let's keep going. Let's take another step forward. Let's bring ourselves into the 20th century. And now we're going to look at the Dutch astronomer Jacobus Kepkin. He was looking at the night sky, and at this point, our understanding of electromagnetism has skyrocketed. We have a thorough understanding of what electromagnetic waves are, Doppler shifts. And so Captain said, well, let me look at the night sky. And he identified two streams of stars. He was able to break down stars in this stream models. And he said, look, half of the stars are coming towards us. Half the stars are going away. So, set yourself in the Milky Way. Get yourself on a little roller coaster ride. And you notice how some of it's coming towards you, some of it's going away. Do you see that torquing pattern? That rotation that we're starting to get? Captain, with his streams, had just discovered the rotation of the Milky Way. Absolute definitive proof that the Milky Way is actually rotating. Now, Captain didn't know this at the time. He didn't understand that. We, having a century more of, of advancements past him, are able to look back that, at that and understand it. But this is building the foundation of more information. He's got that rotation. Here's like a modern measurement of, the, of that Captain Streams seeing the amount of blue shift versus red shift as you're looking at your galactic view. So here you're looking at the center of the Milky Way, and now you're looking at the regions of the Milky Way that are coming away from us, or the regions that are coming towards us, blue shifted, red shifted. You'll hear me talk more about this again later, but I want to emphasize it now. These modern measurements use what's called the 21 centimeter wavelength, or the 21 centimeter line. This is a specific wavelength of light that's produced in hydrogen through a process called electron spin flips. This is absolutely crucial for us in understanding our map of the, of the Milky Way. Moving only a few years past Captain, and we get to Henrietta Leavitt, who invents a tool for better measuring the distances to the stars. Remember, we've studied Henrietta before. We looked at her photographic plates and how she was able to find the pulsations of the stars. And she noticed that there was this relationship between the period, the time it takes for it to pulsate, and how luminous it is. The longer the period, the greater the luminosity. 
So by using these C5 variables now, if you can identify a C5 variable somewhere out there, measure the time of its pulsation, and you get yourself an accurate distance measurement because you know exactly how luminous it is. So Leavitt's techniques of C5 variables becomes a standard tool and all the other astronomers start to use it. Right? Go to 1970 now and you have a Harlow Shapley who is using the Leavitt's law of that pulsation time. And he's looking specifically at these globular clusters, giant gatherings, a lot of stars. And he uses the clusters to estimate the size Milky Way. He's going a step beyond what, what the Herschels had accomplished. And he's able to get more accurate measurements. And he gets a size of about 100,000 light years. Getting close. That's about half rounding. About half of what we now know today to be the accurate measure. So Shapley's got this amazing tool for taking distances. And he applies it. And here's his map of the Milky Way superimposed on the Herschel's map. And you'll notice what Shapley just did was take the sun and he moved it far away from the center, about two thirds if you remember the beginning, about two thirds of the distance away from the center of the Milky Way. And he gets a distance, he gets the size of the Milky Way that's much larger. And now what Shapley just did was make the universe even bigger and grander than anyone had ever imagined before. Now in the same year, in 1917, Shapley said, look, the Milky Way is 100,000 light years large. Another astronomer, a man named Herbert Curtis, he, looking at the Andromeda Nebula, noticed a nova. Not a supernova, just a sudden brightening of the star. And he said, wait a minute, we think we understand how bright that is, how bright it should have been. So he uses that nova to estimate the distance to the Andromeda Nebula. And he gets an estimate of 500,000 light years. Five times the size of the Milky Way. That shapely just, just determined. And so now Curtis is saying, that nebula is not a nebula. It's its own universe, far removed from the Milky Way. And this triggers what we call today the Great Debate. So in 1920, the Great Debate was between Harlow Shapley and Herbert Curtis. And they're literally arguing over how big the universe is. What is the size and grandeur of the scale? So I'll go through them point by point. Uh, and this is a brief summary. Basically, these two astronomers were trying to say what fact exists out there and what do we need to know. And they put not just this debate towards each other, but to the astronomical community across the globe, saying these are the open questions we need to figure out. So this is point by point. Shapley, Shapley, he said the Milky Way is the universe. He said that is the size of the universe. Curtis, remember his nova, he says, no, no, he says the Milky Way is just one small part of a much bigger universe. We come back to Shapley. He says, look, you're looking at these nebula, and they're just gas clouds. Yes, they're swirling vortices that Lord Rossi had discovered, but that's just a slightly bigger version of our solar system, just these gas clouds just out there inside the Milky Way. Well, Herb Curtis obviously said, no, no, those nebulae exist outside the Milky Way. They are their own galaxies or island universes. Shapley says, look, the sun is far from the center of the Milky Way. We're almost two-thirds of the way out of the picture. And Curtis says, hey, we got to be close to the Milky Way center. Have to be. So here's the point. I've highlighted in red here and these bullet points I've listed who was right in each category. And across the entire debate, they both had different points they are correct about. Curtis was right about the size of the universe being much bigger than the Milky Way. Shapley was, was more accurate about where we exist in this in picture. So each scientist had some correct points. Historically, some people will say that Curtis was the winner of the debate, but it wasn't about winning. It's about putting a challenge out there to fix this. And only a few more years after this short debate, 
became uh, came into the picture, Edwin Hubble, who definitively solved the size problem. So, from 1924 to 1929, a lot of work happens, thanks to Edwin Hubble. Some people say he's probably one of the most important astronomers of all time. And, just like with Lord Rossi, getting a nice bigger telescope, getting better measurements, Edwin Hubble, he got to work on the newest, biggest telescope of the time. And, he looked at C5 variables that was inside the nebula, making them his standard candles. When I say standard candle, I mean this is now my unit of measurement. This is going to be my meter stick, these standard candles. And with that, he was able to look at the Andromeda Nebula and with absolute certainty, indisputable evidence, say that thing exists outside of the Milky Way. And the debate is solved now. The Milky Way is one galaxy of many, one universe of thousands of others. We're going to be talking a lot about Edwin Hubble. He's going to keep coming back for us over and over again. So, I just want to hit some of the key points that matter a lot for us. Hubble devised a classification scheme to categorize these, ca these galaxies based on their structure and their luminosity. A very important one, this will come up in a later section, is the galactic redshift. And we've, it's basically uh, another way to say the Doppler shift. You say, what's this observed wavelength minus the rest? What would be the wavelength that thing was coming at us? And you create this number, just dimensionless number, this Z thing. And you say, look, I calculate this Z quantity multiplied by the speed of light, and I can tell you how fast that object is moving relative to us. And what Edwin Hubble was, there is a constant redshift across the universe. This will be an absolutely crucial, important fact for us later on. Slight modification of that is what's now called the Hubble-Lumiere law, where he said, look, I can get the recessional velocity multiplied by this h naught, the Hubble's constant, and get the distance. And so Hubble not only said these galaxies exist outside of the Milky Way, he started measuring how fast they're moving. And we'll deal with those consequences later. We want to come back to our main question. The goal of this entire part was, what's the freaking Milky Way look like? What is its shape? Well, we've got a lot of tools now. By studying the nebulae, we've said, look, there are these galaxies outside of the Milky Way. So the Milky Way has to be a galaxy. Let's start figuring out what it looks like. So in the 1930s, a man named Robert Trumpler, he starts looking at open star clusters. And by using the open star clusters, he's actually figuring out a way to calculate how dust impacts starlight. What kind of impact starlight has on the dust. This sounds incredibly trivial, but I will tell you, this is astronomical equivalent. Any of you who are wearing glasses and they steam up and you wipe them off. This property here, how starlight's impacted by dust, this is the equivalent to taking your steam glasses and wiping them off, getting rid of that condensation. You now have a clearer view of the cosmos. So we have this idea of how to compensate for the dust obscuring a bunch of light. And another seemingly completely unrelated problem becomes this tool for us to keep exploring the cosmos. Radio is becoming just absolutely prevalent into the 1940s now. And every radio signal on Earth has this hiss, this constant noise that's just present. So, Jan Ort, he says, wait a minute, if this hiss is interfering with every radio signal across the globe, well, it's got to be coming from somewhere. And so he starts pinpointing it and he says, hey, look, this radio signal that's omnipresent on Earth, well, it's coming from the Sagittarius constellation. And people have already been still looking at this and they said, hey, we think Sagittarius is the center of the Milky Way. And Ort says, look, there's all these radio waves just emitting from the center of the Milky Way. He starts collaborating with another astronomer, Hunk Funded Hulse. 
And Hulse actually predicts with the new tools of quantum mechanics, this 21 centimeter line of hydrogen. All right, told you it'd come back. So what is this? You take your hydrogen atom, has to be neutral. So you have hydrogen, one electron. And quantum mechanically, there's this property called spin. Now, some people like to think of this, take the basketball and spin it on your finger and there's the spin of the electron. Mm, classical mechanics, not completely right. Because all of a sudden, it could have one orientation to spin going one direction and then other way. And now it's spinning the other way. So it's not a perfect analog, but this is a quantum phenomenon. An electron could have spin. It could be spin up or it could be spin down. And what Vekadon Hulse was able to show was that when you have just this cold neutral gas of hydrogen and those electrons would go up to down, that actually emit that 21 centimeter line, that radio wave. So now the Hulse and Oort are collaborating saying we can build radio you know, telescopes. Instead of tracking the visible light that has a problem with all the dust in the way, let's look for these radio waves. Hydrogen's the most abundant gas in the universe, and now we have a wavelength that's specific to just hydrogen, and it doesn't really care about that dust. So a few years after that, another group of astronomers come in saying, yes, you can track these radio waves, and then with the tracking of the radio waves, they start tracking the motion of the gas. They're not looking at individual stars moving through the Milky Way. They're saying, well, track the motion of just the gas of the Milky Way itself. And they managed in 1952 to produce this map of the Milky Way. And we get our first definitive evidence that yes, the Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy.